right now on Law and Crime Report. A defense lawyer for one of the officers charged in the death of George Floyd is expanding his argument for a change of venue, saying he received threats by protesters at the most recent hearing. Plus, Harvey Weinstein faces six new sexual assault charges in Los Angeles. L.A. District Attorney said the latest accusations help prosecutors build a compelling case against Weinstein. And later, a guilty verdict was handed down to Joel Guy Jr. in Tennessee after he was charged with the brutal murder of both of his parents over Thanksgiving weekend. This is Law & Crime Report, diving into true crime and all legal stories making the headlines. All right, now, welcome back to Law & Crime Report. You know we're going to be having a great show today. I got some amazing guests for you and some great topics. Let's start off with the Minnesota George Floyd case, a defense attorney apoplectic about what he says the judge is making a mess of the proceedings, that they're being attacked, that they want to change a venue. Our very own Aaron Keller here at the Law & Crime Network has a report for us. Let's take a listen, Aaron. <laughs> Law and Crime's cameras were there as a large crowd gathered when these cops are convicted. and made a large amount of noise and it shall be a glorious morning. as the defendant police officers left court and as officials attempted to speak. Emotions that have been heard by the court. Now, attorneys for J. Alexander King are flipping the protesters' tactics against them by arguing the trial or trials should be moved to another county. Speaking of a co-defendant, they wrote, Mr. Chauvin, who is in custody, was subjected to a degree of humiliation by being paraded in public dressed in jail clothes and body armor. The misspelling of clothes appears in the original. The document further says attorneys and defendants were harassed upon arrival and departure from the courthouse. Toe Tao and his attorney were were followed for several blocks by jeering protesters. Other attorneys and clients were also harassed, the document says. Attorney Earl Gray and defendant Thomas Lane were physically assaulted. Rioters caused $2,000 in damage to a private vehicle. And the so-called chaotic events could be heard inside the courthouse. The defendants further complained that court security officers told them to wait until George Floyd family attorney Ben Crump stopped speaking to the crowd. We demand justice for George Floyd Jr. They say that advice was foolish because they say Crump and his fellow lawyers would incite the crowd, making their departure far more risky and tempt rioters to storm the courthouse. In summary, the defense argues that local prejudices and feelings and a riotous crowd prevent a fair trial from being held locally because a jury would likely hear the protesters and witnesses entering and leaving the court facility will be intimidated, they argue. Plus, the attorneys and their defendants say they fear for their safety. This is Aaron Keller for the Law and Crime Network. Wow, what a story. I got two great guests. It would be Bernardo Villalona out of New York, trial attorney, former uh, senior homicide prosecutor, legal analyst, and newly minted defense lawyer. Welcome to the show, Bernardo. Thank you for having me, Bob. All right. And Mike Corbanix, former assistant prosecutor, a New Jersey Supreme Court certified criminal trial lawyer. There's less than 250 out of 98,000 lawyers that have that distinction. Admitted to the Supreme Court, does defense work in state and federal court. Welcome to the show, Mike. Thank you, Bob. Thanks for having me. Sure. Bernardo, let me start with you. I mean, I understand the anxieties. We're talking as trial lawyers now. Um, if this 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 uh, demonstration outside the courthouse, what is going on there? They talk about justice. I understand that. I understand the anger. But we do have a judicial system. What impact is this having on a defendant? I don't care what defendant. I don't care what they're accused of or who they are. A defendant's right to a fair trial, Bernardo. Yeah, so obviously with all the protesting and the screaming that's going on outside of the courthouse, it is having an impact on the proceedings thus far in terms of the media being there, in terms of possible uh, jurors that are being, I guess, uh, threatening the jury pool. So it's going to be a problem, but still, it is not a reason to request a change of venue at this point. Because the only reason for a change of venue is if you cannot get a fair and impartial jury. So at this point, the jurors have not been questioned. So we don't know if that is a possibility. So it's still early on to determine that. 
Yeah, Mike, we've talked about this uh, extrajudicial statement, statements that are made outside of the courtroom, which are generally prohibited in the law in order to ensure that people can get fair trials. Um, obviously, no one is doing anything about that. Uh, there is a pending case that's, that's uh, there. But uh, what concerns me also is that the defense lawyers are being attacked. The judge is being followed. This can have a significant impact on their ability to be fair and partial as far as a judge is concerned and as a defense lawyer in, in giving a vigorous defense. And, and I go back to I don't care what case it is, who it is. Everyone is entitled under our Constitution to a vigorous defense. Mike, put yourself in the shoes of the defense lawyers here. What are your thoughts about all this? This is difficult, Bob, because I, I've, I have previously, I've never, I've always thought that change of venues in this day of social media, internet, and so much information out there really doesn't affect a jury pool because it's very difficult not to know about this case, no matter where you live. Uh, defendants are assured to have a right of a trial by their peers and in the community they live in. However, the one, that dif the one aspect that differentiates in this matter is the threat of physical violence, if it's true. I mean, we just have submissions now and need to go further to see whether or not that's a problem. If there is a problem to safety, I think this, they may have to either be in touch with the First Amendment and make it safer where protesters could voice their opinion, but not necessarily in such a way where it conflicts with somebody's constitutional right to a fair trial. That's something I think the judge has to take into consideration. And it also seems that they may have to have an anonymous jury if people are feeling intimidated by protesters. Yeah, Bernardo, what do you think about those points that Mike bring, brings out? Not so much towards the change of venue, but the even if they don't change venue, the ability to impact a fair and impartial proceeding. Um, the judge has got to step in here and do something, don't you think? So I think Bob will probably will be the proper recourse maybe is to act at the time that there is a trial and that they're selecting a jury, that the jury be sequestered because of all the media, because of the daily protests. Because remember, these jurors are going to have to enter the same doors where these people are protesting. Yes, people have a First Amendment right to peacefully protest, but it's also going to be clashing with the defendant's right to a fair trial. So I think what we need here is probably a sequestration, not in, in terms of a change of venue, but rather a sequestration. And also the police department, as well as the court officers, are going to have to step up. Because the reality is, is that even though the, these defendants are on trial, you still have to keep them safe, as well yeah. as the attorneys safe, as well as everyone else that is out there. Man, I, I step, police have to step up. I, I, I'm not disagreeing with you, Bernardo, at all, but boy, oh boy, what a position that's putting them in, given the uh, entire dynamic that's out there. Anyway, great commentary, guys. Harvey Weinstein uh, on Friday was charged with raping two more women. Uh, six new charges, three of which were forcible rape and forcible oral copulation. Uh, Mike Corbanix, uh, this is out in California. I mean, how many bullets can Mr. Weinstein dodge here as a defense lawyer? What are you thinking? What are you strategizing? What are you doing? I know we don't have all the facts, but thoughts. It's a difficult position for a defendant because you're in a situation where how much, if he in fact is found guilty here and his other convictions hold up, how much time can one person do? When does it just become an exercise in futility? On the other aspect, why, I'm sure Weinstein's looking at, what do I have to lose? I have to fight everything in case my other cases get overturned, something of that nature. So I don't think he's inclined to strike a plea deal. I think just by his very nature, he's going to fight every allegation. Uh, it's going to be very difficult for attorneys, and it's going to be very draining on him financially. The irony here is he has so many charges, we may one day see Harvey Weinstein applying for a public defender if this rate comes up, because these are very expensive cases to try. I don't care how much money you have. Yeah, Bernarda, uh, to, to some of Mike's points, I mean, you're now, a, 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 like I said, a newly minted defense lawyer, a tremendously capable uh, trial attorney. So, yeah, you, you try to get a global resolution in cases like this, but given his age, any numbers that I believe prosecutors would offer would pretty much amount to a life sentence to the guy. So, He's pretty much going to have to slug it out. Do you see it differently? No, I agree. There's no reason for him to take a plea in this case because, because of his age, regardless of the numbers that they give him, 
obviously the Los Angeles, the California DA's office is going to request that that sentence run consecutive to the sentence that he was given in New York. So there's no reason for him to plead guilty because the reality is, is that given his age, it is a life sentence for him. And remember, we already got a sneak peek as to the testimony of one of the victims because one of the victims in the California case testified as a Molyneux witness in the New York case. Can you explain what that means, a Molyneux witness? So remember uh, early January that during the trial in New York, uh, one of the victims in that case, in, I'm sorry, in the California case, testified, and I believe she even, when she testified, she said something about that she still had the dress where Harvey Weinstein unleashed himself on. So based on her testimony, the prosecutor used her experience to show that Harvey Weinstein had some kind of motive. This was like a, a means. It was something that he was doing on a regular basis, so it wasn't a mistake. So they actually used it as cumulative evidence in his case in chief. Yeah, excellent explanation. Mike, just real quick, I'm just curious. Uh, does Weinstein ever get to a point where he just says, look, enough to your point. I'm not going to go bankrupt all the, over all this. I can give some of my money away, assuming he's got any money to give away, and just fall on his sword and, and just say, I'm, I'm just going to give up and do my jail time, and that's it. I'm, I'm resolved to my fate. I don't think Harvey Weinstein, from what we've observed from the testimony in the cases we've observed here at Law and Crime Network, and things of that nature. I don't think Harvey Weinstein's a person who, and I don't mean this to be funny, he does not take no or stop as an answer. And I think he's going to keep going. <laughs> yeah, okay, Mike, uh, very good uh, turn on words there for sure. Guys, listen, we got a lot more, including the um, Kentucky Attorney General, Daniel Cameron, who's going on, coming under a lot of heat with regard to the Breonna Taylor. That's right up after the break. Stay with us. Lawyers with our Office of Special Prosecutions presented the findings of our independent investigation before a grand jury comprised of Jefferson County residents beginning on Monday and concluding today. In Fletcher v. Graham, the Kentucky Supreme Court said that the grand jury has competing but balanced functions. On the one hand, its purpose is to investigate allegations of criminal conduct and determine if there is probable cause to believe that a crime has been committed. On the other, the grand jury serves to protect the public against unfounded criminal prosecutions where probable cause is lacking. The grand jury is unique in our criminal justice system because it operates independent of the court and the prosecutor. The hallmark of the grand jury is its independence from outside influence. This independence is necessary to ensure that justice is done both for the victims and for the accused. After hearing the evidence from our team of prosecutors, the grand jury voted to return an indictment against Detective Hankinson for three counts of wanton endangerment for wantonly placing the three individuals in apartment three in danger of serious physical injury or death. The charge of wanton endangerment in the first degree is a Class D felony, and if found guilty, the accused can serve up to five years for each count. Kentucky law states that a person is guilty of wanton endangerment in the first degree when under circumstances manifesting in strength indifference to the value of human life, he wantonly engages in conduct which creates a substantial danger of death or serious physical injury to another person. My office is prepared to prove these charges at trial. However, it's important to note that he is presumed innocent until proven guilty. During the last six months, we've all heard mention of possible charges that could be brought in this case. It's important to understand that all the charges that have been mentioned have specific meanings and ramifications. Criminal homicide encompasses the taking of a life by another. While there are six possible homicide charges under Kentucky law, these charges are not applicable to the facts before us because our investigation showed and the grand jury agreed that Mattingly and Cosgrove 
were justified in the return of deadly fire. Mm, uh, Bernard, uh, let me go to you first here with this. I don't disagree with the enunciation of what the law is and what a grand jury does, but there, these tapes were released. So my first question to you is, usually these proceedings are secretive. Uh, the court ordered this, which is very unusual, but that last phrase that he said, the attorney general, uh, I think me and you may have been talking about this earlier. The question was whether the charges against the officers as they related to Breonna Taylor were actually presented to them. In other words, whether or not the prosecutor said they could consider charges against those officers. So that last statement he made there seems to be a little off because at least, and I haven't listened to disclaimer here to all 15 hours, but from the reporting I'm seeing, they were not advised that they could consider charges against the officers with regard to Breonna Taylor because the prosecutors and the grand jury were saying it amounted to self-defense. Give me your thoughts, Bernarda. Look, Bob, Attorney General Daniel Cameron was so disingenuous doing that press conference. Not even say disingenuous, Daniel Cameron lied. For you to say that the grand jury agreed with your position mm -hmm. is a complete lie. We now have the audio recordings of that grand jury presentation. And I'll just note for you that Daniel Cameron know that he was so much in the wrong that with the release of those audio recordings, he did not include the charges that were given to the grand jury. He did not include mm. that as part of the release. He also did not include the deliberations by the grand jury. But we now know is that Attorney General Daniel Cameron, you never even gave the grand jury an opportunity to deliberate on those charges. You took away their role when you made the unilateral decision not to present those charges to the grand jury. The grand jury can only deliberate on what the law is of what you give them. They cannot unilaterally return an indictment or a no true bill if you don't give them the option with the law given to them. So you lied and you took away the role of the grand jury when you decided to put forth the charges that you wanted and the evidence that you wanted. And I really think it's really disgusting and just so disingenuous of what you did and the role of the prosecutor. You were supposed to serve as the legal advisor but instead, you were the legal advisor as well as the fact finder when you put forward selective testimony. Yeah, Mike, to Bernardo's point, even though the, the prosecutor is just there as a person to present information and the grand jury is, in fact, an indef independent investigative body, the fact of the matter is prosecutors have tremendous sway over what happens at a grand jury for the very reason that Bernardo just mentioned. Uh, we don't even have what law was charged to the jurors, and that is very unusual. I don't know if that state is different than New York and New Jersey. I suspect it's not, and just so our audience understands, when a prosecutor is done introducing evidence, because I, I believe collectively we probably presented thousands of cases before a grand mm -hmm. jury, the, the prosecutor then reads to them the applicable law for the charges that they're considering. That did not come to us. So we have no idea what it was that they were charged with, but we do have a very good inclination that they were advised that there should be no information with respect to Breonna Taylor's killing because they deemed themselves that it was self-defense. Mike, what are your thoughts about all this? You know, Bob, it's so funny. As you, we were watching that clip again, it, I almost feel like, we're, we're in court on trial because you hear a witness make a statement and all of a sudden something jumps out you in a different context. I find it very troubling, the statement where he says, uh, our, our investigation showed and the grand jury agreed or worked yeah. to that effect with our findings. Your findings in the grand jury are irrelevant as a prosecutor, quite frankly. You should, only, you should be presenting the evidence of your investigation Using the term agrees means we showed evidence that we felt showed that these people who are defendants in this matter did not violate the law. I find that a very troubling statement by a prosecutor. Furthermore, the redaction of the law is even more so troubling. And it just seems that this has not been held to the high standard as other grand juries, especially, Bob, I was amazed, I haven't listened to all the hearing of all the grand jury testimony, but just to hear that they read police officer statements 
to the grand jury that did not subject them to questions by the grand jury were not only self-serving, but I don't know, Bob, we're, we're from a state with a very famous case, Garrity versus, United, versus New Jersey, that the United States Supreme Court said that public officials who give statements to investigations cannot be used against them in a criminal proceeding. Here, what they did was, in my opinion, use self-serving statements to help the defendants in this matter. And I don't think that's any way the position of a prosecutor in a fair and impartial showing of a grand jury presentment. Yeah, Especially just to be— when those people are not quite able to be questioned by the grand jury. That's a yeah, problem. Just to be fair, Mike, uh, and I, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you, but uh, hearsay is admissible in a grand jury proceeding. The standard is very low, and it very well could be. We don't know, but it could be that those police officers exercise their right to remain silent uh, because they are targets of an investigation. So that could kind of explain that. But um, it, it's just really unfortunate that we got to this place. Now, guys, one real quick last thing about this is it turns out that we find out from these recordings that they never executed the search warrant. In other words, they never searched. That came out in the recordings as well. Bernardo, do you have um, any inclination as to why that was? I mean, I think I do. A lot of people are making an issue about it. What do you think? I don't think that they didn't search because obviously the crime scene unit went inside of the location and photographed and made note of all the ballistics inside of the home. So don't tell me that you did not actually search because you were all around that home in order to document the crime scene. Right. Mike, thoughts? Um, that's very difficult for me to, to, to comprehend that you went on a search warrant where there was a shooting and you're supposedly law enforcement, you're supposedly responsible and you should be quite frankly, able to, I know there was a shooting, unexpected, as they say, things of that matter, things get chaotic, but you're a trained professional. People should be handling the crime scene where the shooting occurred, as well as those who are responsible for the search warrant should have executed it as well. You don't stop because there's a shooting when you're law enforcement. Okay, let me go a little criminal justice reform real quick, guys. At least in New Jersey, when I was prosecutor, if there was a police-involved fatality, when you presented the matter to the grand jury, you had to present, irrespective of what your feelings are, sort of what Mike was saying before, the evidence, and let them consider whether or not they want to bring forward charges. I don't know if that requirement exists out there, but it certainly would prevent something like this, don't you think? Mike? I'm sorry, Bob. That is by presenting it evidence in, in what context? You have to always present all the evidence with regard to a fatality and ask the jurors to consider any Absolutely. charges irrespective of what your thoughts are. That would kind of eliminate all this, would it not? Absolutely, and, and Bob, but you also, even though you can have hearsay evidence, you need to have evidence that is credible. You, 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 and, and using self-serving statements that were given is, is the problem I have. Not that they were hearsay, but they were hearsay because they're self-serving and they were not subject to questions by the grand jury. Now, Bernardo, some police officers think that that is unfair. I can tell you per from personal experience that if you don't believe as a prosecutor there's a case there, typically speaking, you would not bring it forward. That is a very fair prosecutorial discretion decision. It happens all the time, every day. And some cops would complain by the mere fact that simply because it was a fatality, even though you knew it was justified, why are you subjecting me to being possibly viewed uh, by the grand jury for criminal charges. What do you think? See, but the problem is, Bob, is that there's a fact issue. So there are issues as to fact. So because there are issues as to fact, then you let the fact finder, which is the grand jury, determine what the actual facts are. I can understand if it was a situation that it was all on video and completely clear that these officers were justified. And then the prosecutor can be like, okay, I'm not presenting these charges to a grand jury because I've determined based on video, no issue of fact that the officers were justified. But you don't have that here. There are issues as to fact. There are issues as to who fired, where did they fire? How long were they firing? Were there any type of time that passed between the firing? Because I can tell you this from listening to the 911 call, there was, they said they entered at 1240, but still at 1244 and 1245, there were still 911 calls of, of people saying that the police were still firing. So how long did this shootout actually transpire? And plus you had issues where the officer said, one officer said 
that they saw Kenneth Walker with an AR-15. We know that was not the case. So again, because there are so many issues of fact, the fact finders to determine what the actual facts are, not the prosecutor. Right, and to your point about videotape, uh, one thing that came out, at least from the reports that I have read, is that they had no explanation as to why there were no body cams working with respect to that. Thank you, guys. Excellent point. If you guys want to hear about Joel Guy Jr., if you've been following the case, it's one thing. If you haven't, you definitely need to see this. This is the individual who killed both of his parents, put his mother's, dismembered them, put his mother's head in a boiling pot when the police responded. Um, a terrible case. We're going to be talking about that on the other end of the break. We, the jury, find the defendant, Joel Michael Guy, guilty of first-degree premeditated murder of Joel Guy Sr. Count number two, please. We, the jury, find the defendant, Joel Michael Guy, guilty of first-degree premeditated murder of Lisa Guy. Count number three. We, the jury, find the defendant, Joel Michael Guy, guilty of first-degree felony murder of Lisa Guy. Count number four. We, the jury, find the defendant, Joel Michael Guy, guilty of first-degree felony murder of Joel Guy Sr. Count number five. We, the jury, find the defendant, Joel Michael Guy, guilty of felony murder of Lisa Guy. Count number six. We, the jury, find the defendant, Joel Michael Guy, guilty of abuse of a corpse of Joel Guy Sr. And count number seven. We, the jury, find the defendant, Joel Michael Guy, guilty of abuse of a corpse of Lisa Guy. Thank you, Madam. All right, welcome back. So that, that was a straight out conviction. I don't think anybody was overly surprised here. Uh, for people that have done this for a very long time, uh, either myself as an EMT or as a homicide prosecutor, and we have uh, great talent with us today to talk about this, I think it was the abuse of the corpse that, that just made this case just really stand out. And I was putting myself in the shoes of those officers who were doing a welfare check and coming upon this gruesome scene of dismembered body parts, put in vats of chemicals uh, so that they were... Uh, decomposing with great rapidity, uh, and then finding the mother's head inside of an actual boiling pot. It's just really gruesome. Uh, Mike Corbanix, uh, we also, and, and Bernardo, we had victim impact testimony in this case that was really, really compelling from the family. Let's just take a quick listen before we discuss the case. So I don't forget to say thank you to all law enforcement and the lawyers, the court, the jury everyone that had to see all this, then I'm very sorry that this evil's had to come into their life too. And that I will be praying for all of them as I do for my family as well. Dad and Lisa were wonderful. They were larger than life. They were so happy and such really good people. And they loved him. They loved him so much. They loved all of us. And for anyone to do what he did, I don't understand it. He has taken something from myself, from my children, his dad and Lisa's grandchildren, my husband, our family. Everyone in our family, he has taken something from us that we'll never get back. We will. I pray that we can move on from this and that we can put this behind us. I pray that, that my children are not going to be scarred for life from this. The tears that's come from them, the nightmares. I'm so thankful for today. I'm thankful that this day is done. And I'm so thankful that the jury decided guilty on all counts. And I'm thankful for you giving me the opportunity to speak today. Like for four years, I felt like I've pushed it down, like it's not actually happening. But it's real. And they're gone. And Dad was my best friend. 
and I'll never get to hear his laugh again or his just incredible hugs. Um, I'll never get to sit and banter with him and hear the same stories we've all heard over and over, but they're still just as hilarious because Dad was such a storyteller. I'll never get to go fishing with him or, or what he likes to say, have a cocktail. Or it's five o'clock somewhere. I, I was robbed of having my father walk me down the aisle. And Lisa, my last mother on earth, was taken away. She was the most loving and giver, giving person I've ever met. She would give the shirt off her back to anyone, the last dying to anyone. And she, she was my best friend too. They were both robbed of seeing their grandchildren, their handsome boys grow up and turn into incredible men. And to, for them to have to go through this tragedy so young is just, it's heartbreaking. I still, I still have dad on speed dial. Like it hurts me every day not to be able to speak to him. The rest of my life is not going to be the same for any of us. And I know there's a void that will not be replaced until that beautiful day when we meet again. Oh, wow. Uh, so many people affected um, with this uh, absolutely heinous and brutal killing. Supposedly, uh, the motive advanced by the prosecutors in this case was a financial motive. The parents, as is described by the victim impact statements, were very decent people. They cared for him. He really wasn't working. He was living in their home. And they basically uh, retired and were, wanted to move on with their lives and basically said they could no longer financially afford to continue to carry him. Um, and that supposedly precipitated this. Bernarda, uh, you uh, and me have tried lots of murder cases, and there are some of those that just stick out as being those extra, especially heinous ones. Uh, to me, uh, reviewing this case, it's probably one of the most brutal I've seen in terms of just the desecration of his own parents. What are your thoughts about this whole thing? Absolutely, Bob. I spent my last 10 years at the DA's office as a senior homicide prosecutor, and I would tell you that this case would stand out to me forever. It's those cases where it's just so brutal. You got to think that when the detectives went into that location for that safety check, they entered into a slaughterhouse. I mean, the mom's head was inside of a boiling pot. When the officers went upstairs, all they saw were hands because the dad's hands were just laying on the floor. Like, even the detectives would never forget that. What I'm curious to know, though, Bob, is why in this case the prosecutors did not seek the death penalty. <laughs> because you have the aggravating factors here, and that aggravating factor is that both of them were tortured and they were mutilated. So you have the aggravating factors, and if there were any case to seek the death penalty, it would be this one, just because the dad was stabbed over 42 times, mom was stabbed over 31 times, and aside from that, the cutting up of their bodies. Like, you have all the factors here to seek the death penalty. And I'll just note, Bob, throughout the whole trial, Joe Guy Jr. was literally emotionless, no emotion at all. It was like he was just sitting sitting down doing a Zoom call. That's what it looked like to me. Yeah, Mike, uh, Bernarda is prescient because I was going to ask you the very same question in your mind. If there is a death penalty case to be had uh, and the torture aggravating factor, as Bernarda is referring to, is you know, you just can't make a willy-nilly decision as a prosecutor to file a death penalty. There are certain things in the law called aggravating factors that you have to have that exists. And torture has got to be one of the worst ones. And this is like really a bad case. What are your thoughts as to why the prosecutors did not pursue a death penalty? Because typically what would happen is that you wouldn't pursue it if there was a negotiated plea agreement, perhaps, not to put the victim's family through all of this. And like the woman said that she felt bad that the jurors even had to see this. To avoid all of that, you may negotiate for a life sentence. What are your thoughts as to why this was not death penalty? It obviously has all the factors that would command it. <clears throat> I think here, the prosecutor's office, I, I just, and of course, this is speculation, but when you listen to his members of this family speaking, and I think most importantly, the first sister, the half-sister who spoke, she was 
all she spoke about was gratitude and 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 she showed empathy for for the world which goes to speak about how there how she was raised by her parents and i think the one thing that she said that was most defining was we're we're so happy to put this behind us mm-hmm. now is both you and Bernardo know of being such experienced prosecutors in homicides and things of that nature is you, you, you come a point in time where you want to put things to rest and put them behind if that's what the victims want. We know that death penalty cases take forever to get a final disposition by all the appellate courts because of the nature of the fact that basically the government is taking a defendant's life. So mm-hmm. I think part of it might have been that the family might have just said, you know what, we want this to end and have some finality. Mike, I, I think that that's a, an excellent point. I literally was trying a death penalty case where the victim's family asked us, begged us, to take it out of the death penalty because they did, couldn't take the legal process any longer. So that is certainly a fair commentary. We, I guess maybe we'll find out, maybe we won't. Guys, listen, what happens to you when you steal $3.8 million over a number of years from places across the country. If you want to find out the answer to that in the justice system, stay with us. We'll be right back after the break. All right, so what happens when you steal $3.8 million uh, over a number of years across the United States? This is a woman, we're coming from Texas had gone across the United States, had shoplifted and sold goods on eBay. Police estimate it's 3.8 million, but can't even say that it's not a lot more and there weren't a lot more victims. The answer to the quick question of what happens when you spend or uh, the fraud, $3.8 million, at least in the state of Texas, is 54 months in jail. Bernarda, um, now we, we usually shoplifting cases are uh, minor infractions. It's something that stores have to deal with all the time. The use of eBay and other such sites to uh, to push that those products out there has become a cottage industry. So three point eight million, though, that's got to be about the highest shoplifting related kind of uh, thing I've seen. Is the fifty four months appropriate? Well, you know, the feds were really just trying to send a message in this case. I mean, four. Pretty much it's four, four and a half years incarceration is what she's going to face. And, you know, with federal time, you pretty much do all the time that you're giving. But given the amount, $3.8 million, what was this woman stealing? And obviously she became a professional of it. Had it not been for her using the U.S. mail postal service, the feds would not have gone after her. Yeah, Mike, um, let's bounce off a little bit at what Bernard. You, first of all, you can give me your opinion about whether you think the 54 months is appropriate. I know you do a lot of, uh, we've done a lot of federal litigation together, in fact. But, you know, there's this balance prosecutors have to have with what an appropriate punishment is, what deterrence is. But to Bernard's point, too, what a lot of folks don't realize is that you may not be committing a crime even within your state. But if you use what's called an interstate facility, that could be a phone or a computer, which is considered interstate commerce, or you travel in interstate commerce, you could be tripping yourself into a federal charge that can really be draconian. Give me your overall thoughts of the case, Mike, 54 months, whether it's fair. And talk to us a little bit about federal jurisdiction, Michael Kermatix. You got it, Bob. Well, technically, Bob, in today's day and age, the federal wiretap statute has just really increased jurisdiction for all federal cases because of the fact you're using interstate communication. Right now, people are sitting in different states over Zoom calls. I think Zoom calls, if people are plotting crimes over them, are going to could kick in federal di- jurisdiction. But the important thing is the federal government, in my experience with them, in cases sort of like this, see sometimes trends coming. And part of the reason they do an investigation of this magnitude is this is not somebody who is shoplifting and selling just to survive. 3.8 million, you're probably leading a pretty comfortable lifestyle at the expense of others. And I think that's part of why the federal government got involved here, because they want to show deterrence. They are hoping people are watching shows like Law and Crime, where we discuss cases like that. So somebody who thinks this is a good idea to shoplift a little bit put it on eBay, to see how this could get you out of control and into a crime that has serious penalties. I just have a problem, Bob, with this kind of sentence of so long for a nonviolent crime. Now, we don't know 
if in fact she has a prior criminal history, which according to the sentencing tables in federal court, make a huge difference. Right. But I think the feds are achieving their their goal of sending out a message and getting deterrence out there for using things like eBay and the internet to sell right. stolen goods. Right, so like you said, Zoom calls or even using one of these things right here could implicate you if you're in the middle of a crime. I'll add one point to it, Mike. When I was prosecutor, we got a lecture from the Homeland Security people. Uh, shoplifting and these kind of things are a big issue with regard to Homeland Security issues as well. And they gave us a great presentation as to why, trust me, uh, there is a connection. Anyway, I've got to switch gears real quick. Uh, Joe Montana, the famous football player at his Malibu home, had his uh, his wife and he himself, the granddaughter, somebody came into their home, uh, grabbed the granddaughter. Uh, they had to wrestle the granddaughter away. And now they're facing uh, this individual who fled, was captured by the police and is now facing kidnapping charges. Bernard, when I, f I first read this story, not only was it a horrific thing, the child is sleeping in the crib, this person comes in, they won't give the baby up, the mother has to, uh, the grandmother has to kind of wrestle the baby away, this person flees, the lawyers basically said nothing other than she's very remorseful um, and she's sorry, so I don't know, mental illness, was this a real kidnapping uh, 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 situation? But if I were the prosecutor, in my mind, I would be doing everything I could to get search warrants and getting her electronic data to find out whether or not she had been researching things like this to see if this was a bona fide attempt or somebody with a significant mental health illness. Either way, it's creepy. What are your thoughts? I agree, Bob, because first off, what, what I started questioning was, how did she even get on the property? How did she know to go to a particular bedroom to find a granddaughter? Because I'm sure Joe Montana is not living in the small apartment that I am out in California. So how did she know the layout of where to go? But definitely, even though she is remorseful at this point, you know that the crime has already been committed under the prosecution. So she's still going to be charged. So at this point is find out her electronics, do some more investigation, but also see if she has a mental history past. Right. And, and don't worry, with your continued great legal excellence and great commentary on the Law and Crime Network, you will, I'm sure, in short order, be living in a home like Joe Mantania, Bernarda. Um, <laughs> and until that time, though, Mike Corbanix, um, yeah, to Bernardo's point, I just move I mean, into your garage, Bob. That'll be close enough to live into a big home. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Michael. Thank you. Uh, listen, so what do you think, Mike? I mean, you, when you were reading this, I mean, it's just gut-wrenching. It was just moments away that this kid could have uh, absconded. And, and there are so many children that are stolen from their parents and their grandparents. We were just, it's, we were just saying this the other day. We were in the park watching the kids you know, moving around and, and everyone wasn't necessarily that attentive. We had one in the county I was at where the kid was abducted at a county fair, uh, raped and then brutally murdered. These mm. kids are so vulnerable, Mike. What are your thoughts about all this? Well, it, it's scary, but it's very scary, Bob. Um, I, I think this is going to be interesting to see how it goes and plays out. One of the interesting things that I don't know this is speculation from what I've read is it appears Joe Montana really acted very, for lack of a better term, professionally. They said he he tried to, you know, talk her out of it, so and then try to have her give him the child. He had to finally go take the child, but nobody was hurt. But he took steps, which leads me to believe there was some point of familiarity. And much to Bernard's point is, you just don't walk into somebody's home or huge apartment or wherever Joe Montana was living undetected as this occurred and know exactly where to go. So I think we're going to, this is a story I think we should pay attention to. It's going to be very relevant, especially dealing with mental mental illness. illness. Yeah, Bernardo, very quickly, um, as a defense lawyer, you got to be able to show something here that this was not an attempt to make an abduction here, but mental illness in my mind. That's going to be the only defense. Otherwise, she's going to get hit with the mother load of charges. It carries up to an eight-year sentence. Absolutely. So I really hope I'll start from now is requesting her mental health history from prior to that date, because that's what's going to matter. Does she have a history of mental illness? Because you can't just bring along that, oh, today for the first time, now Agreed. I'm experiencing some kind of mental I illness. It's not, you're not gonna be successful. Agreed. Agree completely, Bernard. So unfortunately, we have to go. What an awesome panel. Stay tuned for our regularly scheduled program. You can find me at rbianchi, ESQ on Twitter and Instagram. Yeah.